grab your Bible or whatever you use for your Bible. Let's make this confession. Say it out loud. Um, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I do what it tells me to do. And I love my Bible. So I make this as a confession. That I will meditate therein. Both day and night. On a chapter in the morning. And a chapter in the evening. And because I do. My life is blessed. It's no more a mess. Now everything I touch. Everything I touch. It turns to success. In Jesus name. Father we thank you. For those that are gathered together here. Those that have connected with us online, both now and even into the future. We pray over every person present that not one of us will leave the same way that we came. We came to worship you, to sing, to lift up praises to you, to give an offering, a sacrifice to you. But also we came to sit at your feet and to hear words from heaven. And so we pray that you'll use my tongue as the pen of a ready writer to write upon the hearts of every person, both in person and online, your indelible word. We pray that my speech and preaching will not be with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but let it be by demonstration of your spirit and of power, that our faith not rest in the wisdom of a man, but in the power of you, Lord God. We're open to the operation of the gifts of the Spirit should you desire to flow freely in our midst. And we covenant to give you and you only all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise in Jesus' name. And everybody agree with that prayer said. Amen. 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 We want to dismiss all of our teenagers. So if you are a teen or uh, sixth grade to twelfth grade, then we excuse you to go with our uh, executive pastor, Carol, who's going to uh, minister to our teenagers. Give our teenagers a hand clap. This is our future generation. <laughs> Amen. All right, congregation, open with me if you would in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 20. Um, 2 Samuel chapter 5, this has been our text for the past few weeks. We are reminded of this story, a moment in David's life. It says in verse 20, so David went to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there, and he said, the Lord has broken through my armies before me like a breakthrough of water. Therefore, he called the name of that place Baal Perazim. Now, as I said in our introduction, Uh, at the end of worship. I believe with all my heart that God is intending to reveal himself to you in your life, in this season, as the God of breakthrough. That the same way when David was encountered with enemies, even after his promotion, even after a time of elevation, even after his kingdom being expanded, he was met with, you know, armies of enemies that wanted to prevent him and to you know, get rid of him. And I submit to you, in the same way that he called the name of this place, as we call it to this day, Bel Perizim, which is interpreted the God of breakthrough. Amen. In the same way God broke through his enemies, God has broken through your enemies in the same way. Like the breakthrough of water. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So over the past several weeks, we've been focusing on this word from the Lord uh, that came to us about this season. We said in the first day that that in in order to properly receive this um, is you've got to be the good ground that Jesus talked about. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus gave a parable to illustrate how life is like in the kingdom of heaven. And if you've been born again, if you've come to know God, if you have entered into relationship with God, this story is your reality. He said the sower sows the word and Satan comes immediately and takes that word so it doesn't produce in that person's life. Sower sows the word, but Satan brings about affliction and persecution to another group of people, and uh, immediately they're offended. They let go of that word. 
to a third group. The sower sows the word, and that third group, they receive that word. They endure the affliction and persecution. But when cares of this world and uh, deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things enter in, it choke the word, and the word doesn't produce. But then there's a fourth group that, of course, received that word that the sower was sowing. And sure enough, the enemy couldn't get away from him. When pressure came by affliction and persecution, they didn't let it go. When even cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, lust of other things, tried to get in, they didn't let it in, and they held on to the word, and the word produced. I don't know if you know this, but this message is a word, a seed from God that's being sown into your life. He wants to reveal himself to you as the God of breakthrough. That means if you've got situations, if you've been on the cusp, if you've been on the verge, if you've been on the brink, if you've never quite seemed to get into that spot where you know that you're supposed to be into that position or into that assignment, he says this is the season where you're going to see you're going to break through into a new level. But in order to receive that, you've got to be the good ground. You can't let when little things come up cause you to let go of it and you start to believe something other than what God said. Somebody say it out loud. Be the good ground. The second thing we said in order for you to experience breakthrough and to receive this properly is you've got to focus on this word. Focus on what God is saying. The third thing we said as prerequisites to breakthrough is prayer and obedience. We looked at it in the story of David. I mean, he didn't, when the enemies came out, he didn't just run out after them. So many of us are reactive. When a problem comes up, we don't even pray. We just react. Oh, it's quiet. The Bible says to trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. Come on, y'all help me. Acknowledge him in all of your ways. That means check with him first before you respond. And he'll direct your paths. When David did it, he told him to go, and he went, and it was successful. Then when the problem came back up again, he didn't just respond because of the last thing God said. He went back to confirm, what would you have me to do about it? He says, I don't want you to go straight up. I want you to go to around this time. He did it the way God said, and it worked out for him. Come on, somebody. Somebody say prayer Prayer. and obedience are prerequisites in order for you to have breakthrough this year. You have to spend time in prayer, and then you have to obey what God said when he says it. Then last week, I don't know if you were encouraged, but I was encouraged. Another prerequisite for breakthrough is you got to overcome discouragement. And there are going to be some serious things that come up this year, maybe even already for you. Uh, Amen. There are going to be some things that come up that could be very, very discouraging. I mean, you know, we just uh, uh, did a home going yesterday for one who is faith family to us, you know, someone we love dearly, you know, uh, others uh, we believe in with different families in the church that even already this year, January, what's it, the 23rd, amen, have, have lost loved ones. And, and, you know, maybe already, you know, even at the end of the first month, maybe something has happened and it's already like, man, this is going to be, you know, just a repeat of all this other Well, in order for you to experience breakthrough, you're going to have to learn how to overcome discouragement. We see it in David's life, just as it was in 2 Samuel 5. He could have been discouraged. You know, here I am finally stepping into my place as a king, or I finally get married, or we're finally having our our family, or we're finally moved in, we're finally got a better car, we finally, and then all of a sudden something comes that really slaps the smile off your face. What do you do in that moment when people close to you turn, as it were, against you? The Bible said David, when nobody else could encourage him, David encouraged himself in the Lord his God, which taught us that in order for us to experience breakthrough, we see the biblical precedent that we've got to overcome discouragement. There's a second part to overcoming discouragement. And that is, you've got to shake it off. The title of this message today is Shake It Off. And essentially, I want to show you from the scriptures that no matter what comes up this year, if it's not from God, if it's from the enemy, the pit of hell, learn how to shake it off. Somebody say, shake it off. In Acts chapter 27, Paul ended up 
in a really bad place. Like it was for David at a place where, I mean, this could be the end of his life. People were talking about killing them. He told the people he was going on a ship and he was in, in custody, supposed to be taken to see, you know, some kings and some rulers in authority. And he told the, the guy that was driving the ship, you know, I just perceive in my heart that this voyage is going to be with great harm and loss. I think we need to hold up for a moment. Well, the guy says, you're a preacher, and he's the captain of the ship. He asked the captain of the ship, <laughs> come on, you all help me. He, he felt, he said, no, it's going to be, a, you know, the wind is blowing soft. It's, I think we're going to have a good voyage. And the guy that was the decision maker went, went with this other guy. Maybe you're on the job and, you know, you, 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 you've got this idea and you've got this thought, but somebody else has a thought and now we're going in a different direction. And now all of a sudden he ended up in a place. He was in a, a, a Euroclidon, and which essentially is like a typhoon, a hurricane, or a number of storms mixed together. And all of these people that are on this ship, they're fe fearing for their life. They were on this ship for days. If you read your chapter and everybody at Faith Family reads their chapter, amen, then we'll read Acts 27 this week. But I just want to show you that this voyage came with great shipwreck. In verse 41 it says, But striking a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the prow stuck fast and remained immovable, but the stern was being broken up by the violence of the waves. You know, essentially, Paul is on a ship that ended up being shipwrecked, stuck in the ground, and the waves are tearing off the back of the boat. And all of these men, some prisoners, some soldiers, some sailors, fearing that their lives, they're, they're, the, the, the prisoners, everybody's like the, the ship is about to break apart. If you read the rest of the chapter, it is about to break apart. And the soldiers thought, well, we need to kill the prisoners, in which Paul is a prisoner. We need to kill the prisoners unless they swim out and escape. I mean, this is a point where Paul could die. But sure enough, now the, the, the leader of the, 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 the captain knows a little bit better and followed Paul's advice. He said, well, no, he said, God said that nobody's life is going to be lost, so you can't kill him. So everybody ended up jumping into the water on pieces of the ship, and they finally swim and make it to shore. And the whole group of them come out of water. I don't know what the last two years have been for you. Maybe it feels like shipwreck. Maybe it feels like everything has been lost and just so much. And you've run through your savings and you haven't quite recovered. And, it, you know, you thought that this from the government would be a boost, but, you know, it never really caught back to be. Who am I preaching to today? And it has never really caught up to be back to what you had expected it to be or you wanted it to be. You finally, as it were, you seem like you get you catch a break. And if it ain't one thing, it's another. I want to pick up this story in Acts chapter 28, reading verse 1 through 6. Bear with me. Now, when they had escaped this shipwreck, then they found that the island was called Malta, and the natives showed unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw that the creature, saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow him to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting he would swell up and suddenly fall dead. But after they looked for a long time, he saw or, and saw no harm come to him. They changed their minds and said that he was a God. I'm here to tell you, you're going to have to learn how to shake it off. 
You may find yourself at some point in this year having escaped the fire and have escaped the flood and having escaped the shipwreck, finding yourself gathering and thinking like, okay, you know, we made it out of that thing. And then sure enough, you get attacked by something else. That is not the time to sit in the floor. That is not the time to have a pity party. That is not the time to start bawling and squalling. That's time to shake it off and give God praise. There have been times in life where people have experienced things. Um, it's like that Morton Salt commercial that, you know, the little girl is carrying the salt home and she's got the umbrella. And I don't know if they still put that on the Morton Salt packaging. But, you know, the idea was that when it, rain, when it rains, it pours. Am I the only one that looked at the package in that clothes? <laughs> but if you've ever, and I know it, man, if you've experienced life beyond 10 years old, you know exactly what I'm talking about where it seems like you can't catch a break. I mean, the finally you get out of this situation and boom, something else comes up. And then you finally, you start celebrating before you can even finish rejoicing. There's another attack from the enemy. If I mean this Acts 28 is the last chapter in the book of Acts. And from about Acts chapter 10 or Acts chapter 12 or Acts chapter 8, when Paul showed up, the, mo the majority of the book of Acts is devoted to the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul. But yet even at the last, he's having to fight. And I wish I could tell you that this season that we're in is going to be without you having to go through a struggle. Without you having to believe beyond what you can see and hope beyond hope. But I submit to you, it's going to be a year of breakthrough. But there might be enemies that come up. And when they come up, don't get discouraged. Overcome discouraged. And if the enemy attacks, what do you do? Let's come on, somebody say, shake it off. Shake it off. The Bible says in Psalm 34, stanza 18 and 19, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. Hmm, that's quite interesting. And the Lord saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. I wish I had a better message to preach. I wish this, th these kind of scriptures weren't in the Bible. I wish it were that if you give your life to the Lord Jesus, if you make him Lord of your life, that from that time forward you're going to live a good life without problems and without troubles. But there's no verse in the Bible that says that. There's no scripture that indicates such. What the Bible does say, though, is that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord, oh, y'all got to help me in this church, the good news, that now it's not good news that there are many afflictions if you're righteous. I've talked to people that felt like because of what they were going through in the moment, they felt like it was better for them before they got saved. That is the saddest thing. Because in reality, how many of y'all know Egypt was not better than the promised land? Yeah, there were giants in the promised land. Yeah, they had to believe God for food in the promised land. But at least they were free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, they were free. In Egypt, they were bound. In Egypt, they were slaves. And I don't know what life was like before you got saved, but for me, I'm so glad that I am born again, even with the troubles that I may see. But I know you and I have been in those situations where it seems like, man, I was doing better before this or better before that. And, you know, sometimes I do marriage counseling. So, you know, I, I minister to marriage people and, and the idea they're sitting there across the desk looking at me, you know, like, help, help. You know, without saying, you know, we're trying to go through the process. And the idea is simply like I, I could do better by myself. Who wrote that book anyway? Who made that play? I could do bad by myself. Oh, y'all got to. Many. What? Are you for real? Yeah. Oh, Pastor, I'm just tired of fighting. All right, you want me to pray for you to go to heaven early? Because <laughs> as long as you are on this planet, you are going to have to fight. 
Fight for your healing. Fight for your finances. Fight for your relationship. Fight for your children. You are going to have a fight. But here is the good news. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Why? Because I have overcome the world. And if he overcame the world and he lives in you, then greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. So many are the afflictions of the righteous, but out of them all the Lord delivers them. I mean, Paul had an amazing testimony. Listen to this in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 27. He said, are they, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labor is abundant. In stripes, meaning like beat like Jesus was. In stripes above measure. In imprisonments more frequently. In deaths. Often from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Five times they beat me with, with a stick or a, a, a whip. They whip me, and they, when they whip you, they whip you with 39 stripes like Jesus. By the stripes of Jesus, we're healed. But even Paul in his service of the Lord encountered enemies and those that would to destroy him. Five times he said, I was beaten with uh, 40 stripes. I was beaten with 40 stripes minus one, verse 25. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times he was stoned. Three times I had was shipwrecked. We just read of one shipwreck. The ship breaks in the part in the wind and I mean for day after day they couldn't even see the sun wherever they didn't have the technology they just wherever that storm was they just tracked the storm just kept them right in the midst and they ended up in shipwreck but that was just one shipwreck there was another shipwreck another ship three, three times I was beaten with rods once I was stoned three times I was shipwrecked a day and a night I had been in the deep you know what that means when the ship wrecked I'm out there treading water y'all remember Magnum P.I. Oh, come on, y'all got a helmet. I'm not, I didn't really dated my... I'm not talking about the new Magnum P. I'm talking about Tom Selleck back in the day. I remember little things when I was a child. But I remember he was out there, and he was just treading water for a long time. Can you imagine a day and a night treading water? A day and a night in the deep, verse 26. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils in the false good. You can see he just started to preach with that. Come on, somebody. And I don't think he was just preaching to preach. I believe in every one of these instances, he's talking about I have had tough times. I have been through tough situations. I've gone through a lot, and I'm not complaining. If they've gone through something, I've gone through something more. If anybody got anything to say about going through stuff, if anybody has anything to say about if it ain't one thing, it's another, Paul says, I got something to say. In 27, he says, in weariness, that means I want to give up, I want to quit, or I feel like I'm weak and weary. In weariness and toil, in sleepness and often, in hunger and in thirst, in fastings often, in cold and in nakedness. What's your point, Pastor Stan? Many, somebody say it. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. I don't know what 2022 holds in the natural. I know in the spirit. That the Bible says that uh, things are going to get worse and worse in this world. In, in, in the spirit, the scripture tells us that in the last days, perilous times will come. We are going to hear about things that will cause our heart to cringe. There will be things that happen in this world to the people of this world. There will be mass things. There will be destruction. There will be hurricanes. There will be fires. There will be death. I just heard of three teenagers that, you know, ended up dying in suicide or murder or whatever. And it's just... Those things are going to be, but I'm not going to let one of them discourage me. And not only that which is in this world, things that come against us, things that come against you, things that come against me. Why? Because he told me many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. See, in Mark chapter 4, verse 17, this is why this thing about being good ground is so important. In Mark 4, 17, he said that there was a group of Christians I'm going bring it into our context, that there was a group of Christians that had no root in themselves. How deep do your roots go in the word of God? 
How deep do your roots go in Christ, in your relationship with God? When it's dry and in a famine, how deep do your roots go to draw upon the waters of the, come on, in the spirit to satisfy you when things are tough on the outside? There was a certain group that had no root in themselves. They hang in there for a time. But then afterward, when affliction and persecution arise for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Notice that word affliction because that's what it said in Psalm. Many are the affliction. See, the enemy is going to try to bring up stuff. He's going to try to give you certain feelings in your body, things that you were healed from, delivered from. You know, like feel like little crazy stuff. What is this going? What is this? It's the enemy trying to get you to let go of this being one of the best years of your life. That without question, this is supposed to be one of your best years ever. And it doesn't matter what comes up in it. You're supposed to end it on top. Oh, come on, come on. He said that you might be the above and not beneath, that you might be the head and not the tail. When the blessing of the Lord is on your life, you can't lose for winning. But the thing is, when the problem comes, how do you process it? When the affliction arises, how do you handle it? In 2 Timothy, I'll give you an example. We just read what he went through. Paul said in chapter 3, verse 10, he said, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, and purpose, and faith, and long-suffering, and love, and perseverance. You've carefully followed my persecution. Somebody say persecution. You've carefully followed my affliction. Somebody say afflictions. Say that, that, that's that group. See, I'm telling you, you got to be good ground. When persecution come against you, when affliction come against you, that ought to be times for rejoicing. I mean, James said, count it all joy when you fall into a difficult time. When affliction and persecution show up, you ought to start laughing. <laughs> when you get the shut off. <laughs> when you get the eviction. <laughs> when the car engine light come on. <laughs> Instead of. <laughs> He said, you've carefully followed my persecution and affliction, which happened to me at Antioch. You saw it when stuff happened to me at Iconium. You saw it when stuff happened to me at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all, <laughs> the Lord did what? The Lord did what? I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter what you're going through. God is already delivered you. He has already broke through over your enemies. <laughs> Confirmation, I don't know if he did this on purpose. Paul, when he wrote this. I don't know if he had Psalm 34 just stirring around in his spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but out of them all the Lord delivered them. Because when he writes to Timothy, he says, you, you've known the persecution." You've known the many afflictions of me as a righteous man. But he concludes it. He says, and out of them all, somebody say all, all. the Lord delivered me. Yeah, amen. Proverbs 24 and 16. It says, for a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. The New Living Translation says the godly may trip seven times, but they will get up again. But one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. Now, we use this often as it relates to Christians doing stuff they don't have no business doing. And we get back up again. A just man may fall, as it were, into sin and get back up again. I feel Donnie McClurklin anointing coming on me right now. <laughs> get back up again. We fall down, but we get up. 
we fall down. And a saint is just a sinner who falls down and get up. Yeah, but I see this in a new light. I see the just running on fire for God. They may trip, but they get back up. The enemy may put something in their path, but they get up. The enemy may knock them down, but he doesn't knock them out. They get back up. They're running for God, and they may trip seven times. And guess what? Seven times they get back up. But for one without a relationship with God, just one thing can just throw them off. One disaster is enough to mess them up. Come on, somebody. One thing. And they're all thrown off. In Psalm 37, stanza 25. Whew, hallelujah. I get ready to close. I'm going to preach myself happy. He said, I was young and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. I could say I was younger than I am now and I'm older than I used to be. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. God's not going to leave you nor forsake you. Doesn't matter what comes up. Doesn't matter what happens. Doesn't matter what you might go through. I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor his children begging for bread. And then in Proverbs 13 and 12, it says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. <coughs> when desire comes, it is a tree of life. The Christian standard, uh, standard Bible says hope delayed makes the heart sick. But desire fulfilled is a tree of life. When you talk about something that you confidently expect being deferred or delayed, it can make you discouraged. You know, it's just delayed. It's like, you know, when will I finally get there? That's the verge. I'm on the verge. I just like I feel I know God. I know what God wants. I know what God has as a, as a church family. We're on the verge of a breakthrough. I mean, talking about new levels, just we're on the verge. I understand what it's like. And if that thing keeps being deferred, if that promotion just keeps getting, getting delayed, and I've been speaking over it. I've been declaring. I've been, I've been saying it. Amen. I know we talked about it weeks ago, but I've been declaring that this is the year. This is the season. This is the time. And you're going to get the call. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 And I know what it's like to be there where hope is deferred and you just live with this con constant expectation of things being better and finally hoping for the getting a breakthrough and finally getting there where your children are concerned, finally getting there where your body is concerned. But some come up and it just keeps singing like the things that we expect from God are deferred or are delayed. Am I talking to anybody? The voice translation. I'm not talking about the ladies that sit up on TV. I'm talking about there's a Bible translation called the voice. For this verse, it says, hope postponed grieves the heart. But when a dream comes true, life is full and sweet. How many of y'all can relate to that? Come on. Hope that is postponed, it grieves the heart. It's like, oh, man, when? But do you know what it's like when a dream comes true? Marquita Donye was a dream come true through for me praise God that's my wife's name amen <laughs> amen and oh I know it's like wow this is like a dream. and there have been other dreams and we have dreams how many of y'all have taken time to write the dream that God has well until that thing happens the fact that it can be postponed can actually grieve your heart but I've got good news God has showed up and he is declaring in this season you're going to experience breakthrough you're going to step into what you've been dreaming you're going to walk into the thing that is going to be like the tree of life there's one last translation of this Woo! and I'm going to prophesy this over you as a matter of fact stand up you can't receive this sitting down 
Oh, I'm here to tell you, you may have seen times go where things have happened and have kept you from what you have been believing for, but you are about to experience a breakthrough. You are right on the edge of it. That's why I got to pour it into you. I've got to pump it in you. Don't give up when you see something contradictory, when you feel something contrary. Don't give in to the pressure. Hold on to that word because something good is about to happen to you. The message translation says, unrelenting disappointment leaves you heart sick, but a sudden good break can turn life around. Read that out loud with me. Unrelenting disappointment leaves you heart sick, but a sudden good break can turn life around. I prophesy over you that you are about to have a sudden good break. I prophesy that God is about to break through in your finances like never before, in your family like never before, in your body like never before. You're about to experience what we call a sudden good break. What it means is things were one way one moment, but then all of a sudden the phone rings. All of a sudden you're in the right place. All of a sudden you're at the right time. Woo! Somebody shout out loud. A sudden good break. But in order for you to experience, you got to learn how to shake it off. You can't let that viper come out and hit your hand. I, you know, I believe I'm done. But I believe when that thing, when he Paul has escaped death many times at this point. This is the last chapter of, of Acts. He's, you know, he's finally getting to a place where he's going to be at peace and he's fulfilled his calling, his assignment. He's writing to churches. But this is one of the last challenges that he really, fe- that he really faces. And sure enough, the way it was, <laughs> he gets out of a, another shipwreck. Finally makes it to shore. They can see the, 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 the day dawn, the, you know, light. Finally gets out of this storm at the end of the tunnel. And everybody's life is saved. God spoke a word to him prophetically in the midst of the storm. And even though they couldn't see any way out, he held on to God's word. And it turned out just like God said, y'all, y'all, all of you all's lives are going to be saved, but the ship is going to be lost. He is standing on the shore looking back at the water. The ship is gone and everybody, exactly what God said came to pass. But it's cold. They're wet. They've been without food for many days. And the, uh, the islanders come out and they start making a fire. That's really nice. Well, you know, being, you know, a good person. It's like, well, hey, y'all grabbing sticks. Let me grab some sticks. And I, I mean, I, I've carried brush before. I've made bonfires just for years. Uh, and I could just see Paul carrying this mass of wood. And he calls it a viper. I mean, it makes me think about a cobra. I don't know if it was a cobra, but it's a viper. And he throws this thing, this pile of wood into this, this bonfire. I mean, scores of men, not just a few men, scores of men, prisoners, soldiers, the islanders, everybody, the, the sailors, all of that. And they're all gathered. And he throws this pile of wood into this fire. And man, you know, I've been there, you know, you throw it in there. Uh, you, you, you know, the, the, the fire kind of envelops it. And out of the fire, this snake, you know, is trying to escape the fire and latches onto his hand I believe with all my heart, he stood there and looked at it. And I <laughs> if it was us, ain't this a trip? <laughs> How about this? This ran through my mind. You got to be kidding me. <laughs> Come on, man. You ain't never, you open up something, you open an email, you get a text message. You get something. Oh, you got to be kidding me. Are you serious? My little nephew says, are you kidding me? Are you serious? And I believe he just held his hand there for a moment because the Bible says that the people of the island, they saw the viper hanging, just hanging from his hand. And they're thinking, man, this guy has got to be a bad guy because I know all of these are are prisoners because now the the soldiers are in effect. They're, you know, 
They got these guys bound. You know, they're making sure nobody's jumping off. The sailors are doing the sailors things. And the islanders are like, okay, he is a prisoner. He must have been a really bad dude because even though he escaped that terrible storm that just passed, you know, justice is coming to take him out, right? But God, he looked at that and he just shook it off into the fire. And that's how you've got to be. And then he just sat down, everybody looking at him. People are going to be looking at you, waiting for the stuff. That, you know, she got a boyfriend. It ain't going to last, you know. <laughs> she, you know oh, they got, he got a promotion. You know, they just waiting for you to mess up. Just shake it off. And what they were saying about you, they'll turn around and say, you know, that's a man of God. That's a woman of God. You know, glory to God. Amen. God is for them. Amen. You know, some of us are carrying some stuff from the previous years into the next year. It's still hanging. That divorce from years ago, still hanging. Oh, it got quiet. You better keep playing. Amen. This is real ministry. What's still hanging on you? The death of a, of a loved one? David said, if I could bring my, 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 my child back, I would. But I can't. So I'm going to worship God. I'm going to go on with life. They thought that, you know, surely he's lost his mind. Because he's going about life. He's worshiping. He cleaned himself. He's, he's moving on. What's hanging on you? Don't get quiet on me now. I'm preaching good. Whatever it is, shake it off. Shake off that breakup. Shake off that divorce. Shake off that death. Shake off they fired you. Shake off you were demoted. Shake off you were laid off. Shake off you lost the car. Shake off whatever. Shake it off. And you'll see God break through for you. Did you all get anything out of this message series? Glory be to God. Father, thank you for these exhortations. We receive them by our spirit, and we, we know that no matter what comes, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but we know, we know, we know, out of them all, you have already delivered us. So we thank you for victory in advance, that we'll praise and give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you're here today in person or online and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, I want to pray with you. Give your life to the Lord, and he'll be the God of breakthrough for you. I want you to pray this prayer. Mean it from your heart. God will save you right where you sit. I want the congregation to pray this out loud just in support of those that are praying for the first time. And if you've backslidden and you want to come home to God, mean this from your heart. God will forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Say this, God in heaven, I thank you for this word today. And I do believe that Jesus Christ, that he is the son of God, that he died for me, they put him in a grave, but I believe he's alive. Come into my heart. Save me from my sins. Lord, I repent for all that I've done, everything that I've said that's not pleasing to you. And I accept by faith your offer of forgiveness. I receive Jesus, the Son of God, as my Lord and personal Savior. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you for delivering me. Thank you for healing me. And thank you for filling me with your Holy Spirit. I receive him now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let's just praise and thank the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for saving us. Thank you for healing us. Thank you for delivering us and filling us with your precious Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. If you don't have a church, every sheep needs a shepherd. You belong to God. But who's your pastor? Get into a good word church like Faith Family Church and then come as much as you possibly can. I'll be preaching another powerful word from heaven on Wednesday night. We won't be in person. It'll be online. But I encourage you, don't miss that opportunity. God is speaking to you if you are a part of this Faith Family. We look to see you next Sunday. Thank you for being a part of our service today. I do want to speak God's blessing upon you. Don't forget, Blowout Sunday, they've got some closing remarks and announcements. But um, glory to God. 
let me speak this blessing. Say, uh, hold your hand up and receive this in your heart. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord give you his peace. May he keep you until we see each other again.